escalation of the war in Ukraine. Every few weeks we think, well, nah, NATO and the United States wouldn't do that. Cross that red line, that boneheaded move. They're not going to send uh, heavy, you know, heavy machinery, high Mars weapons. No, they're not going to do that. They're not going to send Patriot missiles. They're not going to do that. And then, of course, they keep disappointing us week in and week out. And so now another move sending Patriot missiles to Ukraine, Russia responding just a few minutes ago, saying they would attack these Patriot missiles. Uh, they'll see them as legitimate military targets, which, of course. So to make sense of things where where they stand right now, is this a massive escalation of this war? Colonel Douglas McGregor joins us to discuss. Colonel, great to see you. Good to see you. So I, I certainly do not regard this as a major escalation. You do Please, not. No. You do not. No. And I'll tell you why. First of all, this is a, a air and missile defense system that was designed really to do two things destroy incoming tactical ballistic missiles and aircraft. Uh, its, its record is not perfect, but it's a good system. It's a very fragile system, a very expensive system. We're talking about sending seven or eight launchers. Uh, normally, I should even say normally, but you can have as many as eight launchers in one battery. If you do that, that gives you about 128 missiles loaded up in the launchers that can be fired at these tactical ballistic missiles or aircraft. Now, it could also be used against cruise missiles, but that's not what it was designed for, and it doesn't perform nearly as well against cruise missiles and low-flying uh, unmanned aircraft as it does against uh, high-speed aircraft and tactical ballistic missiles. The most that they could do is protect what I would call a high-value target. You could put a certain number of these launchers around a, a headquarters or a co command and control node, potentially a, an ammo storage area, if you thought that was you know, very sensitive. The problem is that that's all it can do. You're not going to be able to protect Kiev. You're not going to be able to protect Lvov, any of the major cities in Ukraine, portions of them only. In other words, this is a point defense system. To have an impact on this war, you would need 10 battalions. Ten battalions would end up being about 1,280 missiles loaded up. Oh, this is going to give you maximum of perhaps 128 missiles. The second part of this is every time you engage a target, you tend to fire two missiles at the target. Well, you're going to end up with lots of targets at any given point in time, and that's by design. The Russians know from experience how to overwhelm air defense systems you will run out of missiles long before you do much damage. And then lastly, it's very hard to move. Uh, mm. This is a very fragile equipment. The radars are sensitive. The slightest damage will put it out of action. And then you have to have highly trained soldiers. Now, I'm told that we've been training Ukrainians in Germany. Well, that's fine. But I doubt very seriously that we would send this equipment anywhere in Ukraine unless we sent along with it U.S., German, or Polish officers who are experienced on the system. This is not something that you train up on for a couple of weeks and then go to war. We send soldiers to six months of intensive schooling and training to operate these systems. So the bottom line is, is this going to have an impact? If so, what's it going to be? It'll be marginal, marginal impact. And by the way, it's very expensive. Uh, depending upon which missile you fire, and there are several different types, they cost between three and six million dollars a piece for each Fire missile Fire. for each yes. missile. Holy. Yeah. yeah. And we do not have uh, we don't have inventories of these missiles to the point where we can afford to fire them endlessly. We're back to the problem of how many missiles do we have on hand? And we don't have assembly lines. This is not the sort of thing that you stamp out at, at uh, Ford's uh, automobile factory. You actually have to have skilled technicians putting these parts together on each missile individually. So the speed with which you could build more missiles is limited by the numbers of technicians that you had to work on the missile components. It's unbelievable. So just the math on this for a second, $3 million per missile to shoot down arguably $30,000 Russian drones, right? And we now know that Russia can, if that's what they're gonna shoot down, what are they, what are they aiming for with these? Just, to, just protection? Well, you, you, they probably tried to shoot down uh, tactical ballistic missiles. This is the Russian Iskander missile, which is very accurate and has a large warhead on it. And the Russians have, we estimate, at least 50 to 100 launchers that could launch uh, Iskander missiles at any given point in time. And again, 
it would not be hard to overwhelm uh, these miss this one missile battery. I mean, you're talking about seven or eight launchers. That's one battery. You'd need 10 battalions to protect Ukrainian forces on the ground and, and key points across the country. That if you were going to war, that's what you would send, 10 battalions. We don't have that to send. Ukrainians can't man them. So the, you know, I'm a glass half full kind of guy. And so I feel like, well, this is good news. This is not an escalation. This is just more of the same. We're going to, we're, we're going through our, we our warehouses and we're finding out some of the, the old stock that we've got. You know, it's like trying to send a Christmas gift at the last minute to, to Ukraine, which Zelensky admitted this week, 50% of his country now has no electricity, 50%. I've heard reports it's even higher than that. So then that sounds like good news. And so it sounds like this is not an escalation, but now we're just sitting here watching the Ukrainian army be devastated, decimated, totally removed as they keep trying to throw troops at this sort of steel wall and Russia doesn't have to do anything. It looks like they can just sort of sit back and absorb all of this. Now, am I wrong? Well, I think you're, you're half right. The Russians don't have to do a great deal and they aren't at the moment. I mean, the vast majority of their forces are preparing for these offensive operations that will be launched whenever the theater commander decides it's the right time. He's been waiting for, an improvement in the weather, that is, for ground to freeze. He's been waiting for uh, all the reservists to be fully integrated. When Once he's satisfied that everything's in place, he'll launch, whenever that is. That could come tomorrow morning or it could come in February. We have no way of knowing. But in the meantime, Ukrainians are fighting tenaciously against the Russians in the south, and they're trying to hold on to this place called Bakhmut, which is being built as a logistical hub because of its connectivity to rail lines and transportation assets. And they're losing it and they're losing thousands of troops in the process the russians meanwhile are taking very few casualties the exchange rate between russia and ukraine is about one to eight or one to ten so for every eight ten eight or ten ukrainian soldiers that are killed only one russian soldier is killed hmm. that's not a good exchange and we think that uh, the entire ukrainian army excluding foreigners that is the, the thousands of polish troops in uniform or Americans and Brits and others that may be there as mercenaries is about 194,000 effectives. In other words, everybody else is wounded or dead. And the people that they're throwing in to these positions are untrained. They're, they're showing up with two or three weeks of preparation, if that. Here's a weapon, get on, get on the truck, you're headed forward. And they climb into these trenches, and essentially they wait around to be destroyed. And that's what the Russians are doing. It's a tragic situation. No one in their right mind would do this. And that's why I'm saying these Patriot missiles, I'm beginning to think this is a gesture. Hmm. This is so sometime in the spring, Ameri American and European leaders can say, well, we did all we could. We sent them everything we had and we just couldn't make it work. Well, this is crazy. Right. This never had any chance of success to begin with. They're lying to everybody about everything. And so then what's next? I mean, it, we heard from we heard from Jen Stoltenberg um, just last week, worried in an interview that this could spiral spiral out of control, uh, not be able to put this genie back in the bottle. So is this right now the West NATO trying to find an off ramp in this and or are we looking to take things to the next level? Well, the next level, once these ground defenses begin, would be nuclear. And I don't see any evidence that anyone in their right mind in Washington or anywhere else in NATO wants to go nuclear. It's very clear the Russians do not. So I, I don't see that occurring. I, to be quite frank with you, we're going to reach a point in time, and I don't know when it'll be, but it'll be probably in the next 90 days, where we could no longer conceal the catastrophe on the ground in Ukraine where Russian forces have overwhelmed and destroyed virtually all of the Ukrainian armed forces. The country is in ruins. And he was saying that whatever happens, which is a change in, in, in words for him, he's usually said, you know, the Ukrainian victory march, which began on 24 February continues, right? He's now saying, well, whatever happens, which means he knows they're going to lose and lose badly. There will never be a good rapport with Russia. We can't go back to business as usual. Our relations will always be poison. Well, that's, that sounds to me like they're preparing themselves for the disaster. 
And again, that's why I think this is a hedge against the very high probability that people are going to stand up and say, well, why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do that? Uh, they're, they're throwing things at Ukraine that Ukraine cannot assimilate and cannot employ. Hmm. And we're sending more Westerners over there in Ukrainian uniform as contractors or soldiers to try and make up for it. It's not going to work. I think everybody knows that. But we're going to continue to the bitter end. And there's not going to be much left of Ukraine when they're through. I, I suppose that, that you change the subject, right? Right. I guess you move on. I have a couple of questions about this, uh, specifically the contractors showing up there and who are now actively involved in the fight. And we had that Newsweek piece that we covered here on the show last week where you have a retired colonel who is now leading Ukrainians, I believe, in the city of Bakhmut. And we just talked about that. A retired colonel from the United States, Milburn, I believe is his name. How does that happen? I mean, pull, can you pull the, the curtain back on this for a second? You're a retired colonel. Do you get a phone call? We need somebody to go. We can't have it be on the books. Would you like to volunteer to go to the front lines and fight Russia? How does this happen? Well, the last word that I had was that uh, the one group that has been engaged uh, is a group called Mozart. Uh, you know, it's the opposite of Wagner on the other right. side of the Russians. And they're pulling out. Uh, they've taken a beating and the Ukrainian forces they've trained have taken a beating. And I think they've said it's time for us to leave. I don't know uh, about this particular individual, but there is an inexhaustible supply of frustrated lieutenant colonels and colonels uh, who want to go back to war mm -hmm. and are willing to lead whatever charge you ask them to lead for enough money. There's a real market out there for mercenaries. Uh, I think it's a bad idea for American citizens to become involved in other people's wars under any circumstances. I think we should go back to the old law that we used to have, which is if you serve in another state's army, you lose your citizenship. I, I just think it's, you know, we've yeah. got to get out of this business once and for all. But it's very popular, and uh, there are lots of people willing to do it. There are lots of uh, recently uh, departed soldiers, people that were on active duty for three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years. And it's there's good money in it. A initially, it was just training. But increasingly, we're seeing the active employment of, of foreigners by the Ukrainians in the front lines. But I wouldn't worry too much about it, because uh, once these offensives begin, no one is going to be in a hurry to go over there at all. In fact, they're having trouble right now recruiting period from foreigners. One more question on that, and then I really quickly want to ask you about the offensive. So this money, where does the money come from? Is this part of a Pentagon budget, part of a normal Pentagon budget drawdown? Or is this like a side, like there's like, it's like petty cash that's kept in the office somewhere. And they kind of, they draw on it secretively for these mercenaries. Well, remember, you have this thing called the black budget that we never see that has billions in it. <laughs> uh, and then you have a number of front organizations through which you can launder the money. So instead of getting your, your cash from, quote unquote, the, one of the alphabet agencies, it's coming through a front entity stood up on foreign soil overseas. It could be in Poland. It could be in Germany. It could be anywhere. And you're recruited and sent off uh, that way. Uh, then you have groups, organizational structures that are, that are out there for sale by me. This is what I want. But it's, it's surreptitiously done in a way that makes it hard for you to trace the cash. But let's face it, virtually all of it's coming from us. We're keeping Ukraine going. We're paying for their government. We're paying for their armed forces. We're paying for their equipment. We're paying for just about everything. The Europeans have slacked off dramatically. I mean, the Italians finally said, we'll, we'll send humanitarian aid, no more military aid. They're not the Lone Rangers. So when the last the last man standing will be us, and then we'll bolt at some point when it becomes obvious we can't stay any longer. I would love to know if this money was laundered through FTX, if there's some connection with FTX and having money run through that uh, to these mercenaries. I wouldn't be surprised. Um, this offensive, we've been talking about the ground freezing, of course, the 20, 20 feet of of famous uh, black soil in Ukraine, which right. has stopped many an army, uh, many for, for hundreds of years. Um, what are you hearing and what are, your, what are your senses tell you about what type of offensive we are going to see before Christmas, after Christmas, and what might that look like? The northern half is frozen. 
the northern half of Ukraine is now largely frozen and would accommodate the, the large forces maneuvering across it. Down south, not yet. You still have areas where there's standing water in some trenches. and You can't do business. You're talking about the Rasputitsa. This is this heavy mud that just makes life miserable for everybody until it finally freezes. That's part of the issue. The second thing is it's a matter of timing on, on the part of uh, the commanding general. He's assembled the forces. Uh, the last count was 540,000 a few weeks ago. It's undoubtedly gone up some more. But it's not just raw numbers. It's the force itself. How is it organized? How is it packaged? What capabilities is it bringing? And I think you, you've got a force now that bears no resemblance to what you saw back in uh, February. This is a very firepower rich force, enormous quantities of standoff attack systems and direct fire weapons. They know exactly where they're going when the time comes. They've, they've established what axes they want to use. We don't know what they are, but clearly they want to do three things. They want to first and foremost, cut Poland off from Ukraine. In other words, make sure that no more Western equipment can come from Poland into Ukraine. That's very important because that dictates certain operations west of the Dnieper River. Secondly, they want to destroy what remains of the Ukrainian armed forces. That's going to be relatively straightforward on the east side of the river. It's a more of an issue on the west side. Again, what does that mean? That means that you've got to encircle and destroy and cut off and annihilate the, what remains of the force. That Remember, I talked about 194,000 effective Ukrainians plus some number of foreigners. That all has to go. <laughs> and then finally, you have to dispose of this regime in Kiev. How can you possibly do business with Zelensky and his crowd? Uh, obviously, he's a puppet. You can't depend on anything he says. We've made it clear that we're not going to support anything that doesn't involve the wholesale humiliation of the Russian state and people. Uh, we've, we've foreclosed all the options and all the avenues towards success. So I think the Russians know this, and that means that they have to lower the boom. They have to drop a sledgehammer on this place. It's going to be terrible. But if you're Russian, what, what else can you do? You, you, you're not dealing with someone you can trust on anything. We've now had these revelations from Merkel about the right. fact that the Minsk Accords were simply a stalling mechanism to buy time for the Ukrainians to arm for the war. Good God. Right. What a disaster. Uh, he, who's he going to talk to? Who's he going to trust? Now, at some point, these governments in the West will go away. And when you sweep these people away, like Schultz in Berlin, Macron in Paris, and whoever turns out to be the next prime minister in England, that's a lottery right now. <laughs> right. Uh, the bottom line is he'll talk to them, but he's not going to talk to Biden or Blinken or any of these people. It's no. absurd. It's a waste of time. So we could either be in for a dark Christmas or wait till after after the new year when this all when this all happens. We'll be keeping an eye on it. Um, Colonel McGregor, right, always great to see. that every day that he waits, things get worse in Ukraine. Right. Nothing's getting better. So right. I mean, he's not in a big hurry. He's, uh, uh, you know, yeah. he can move at, at his at his pleasure. And that's been kind of thrown around over the past week or so with the idea that maybe he won't actually carry out this massive offensive, that this steel wall that's sitting there would just be sort of a permanent wall and Ukraine throws whatever they want at it, but that you don't buy that. That's impossible. How else do you get rid of the Ukrainian armed forces? How else do you get rid of the government? How else do you stop the influx of Western technology, military technology and equipment into Ukraine? You've got to go in. Hmm. See, only option. So people that think nothing is going to happen, I believe, are delusional. Well, you heard it here. Colonel McGregor, always great to see you. Always great to see you. I hope you have a wonderful holiday and uh, hopefully we'll be able to uh, have some some deeper discussions on this and see uh, if the cooler heads prevail after the new year. But uh, Merry Christmas to you. Thank you so much for your great analysis, as always. We really appreciate it.